So let me begin by, um, with a little bit of uh, a word of, of caution or a way to, uh, to think about this, and I urge you to try to keep this in mind throughout the day. It's very easy as we get into areas of cognitive computing and artificial intelligence to rapidly drop down and start to talk about deep machine learning and algorithms and, and some really exciting technologies. And, and for those of you that know me, uh, you know nobody loves technology more than I do. Um, and, and it's a fascinating, fascinating area and lots of that will be um, talked about today. Um, but I think the thing that we must keep in mind is towards what end? Towards what end? What is it that we're, we're really trying to do here? And I would argue that it's all about the outcomes. It's all about changing the world and changing industries and seeing things and getting insights into things that we never have been able to get our arms around before. And so I would urge you throughout the day as we, again, we talk about the various technologies and, and opportunities to keep thinking about what applications, what can we do with this technology? How can we impact society and the human state uh, in ways that we've never been able to do before. So, you know, I sort of put it uh, in the, the flip context, if you will. What is the price of not knowing? Uh, we, we had a, uh, a discussion last night at the Churchill Club and someone asked me, John, what is Watson worth? What is the market value of Watson? And I said, I don't know. It's, it's Really, I mean, I could calculate it based on IBM's business, but I think it's much, much broader than that. You know, what is the price of not knowing the cure for a cancer? What is the price, the downstream cost of that, that patient uh, towards end of life? What is the cost of, you know, not discovering alternate en energy, not drilling into the proper areas? All I know is, I said last night, it's, it's in the billions and trillions. You know, take healthcare as an example. It's a seven or eight trillion dollar industry worldwide, three and a half trillion in the United States, and every estimate says that 30 or 40 percent of that is waste and inefficiency or bad outcomes in the system. So just health care in the United States is a, is a trillion dollar waste or cost of not knowing. So huge opportunity to apply these new technologies. Now, what, what are we really after here and, and what's sort of fueling this. We all know all these things about big data, the amount of data that's being generated, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, another comment or question from last night and, a, and I, a caution flag again is, it's very tempting also, in addition to talking about algorithms, it's, it's very tempting to talk about what we're trying to do here as replicating what the human brain does. That is not at all what this is about. Um, we, when we started out in the early days, as Guru will know with Watson, we, we were not trying to do what previous AI researchers had done to mimic the brain. We were doing something very simple. We were trying to build a system that could deal with this massive amount of data. Because our human intelligence was not scaling the way data is scaling. In a sense, there's a new Moore's law, and that new Moore's law is in the data space. And much of that data is dark or invisible to our current computer systems. And that was the aha moment or the awakening for us in IBM research. We said we need an entirely new type of computer system to deal with this. Today, it's estimated that 80% of the world's data is dark, meaning that we as humans and our current computer systems cannot make sense of that data. It's either noisy or in formats that, that can't be read. And furthermore, that by 2020, that's gonna exceed 90%. Very interesting numbers because if you, for those of you that are, know anything about physics or astrophysics, there's such a thing called dark matter in the universe. There's a set of matter and energy in the universe that is, has not been observed directly but we observe the effects of it in terms of gravity and things. Our optical telescopes and our other telescopes cannot see that matter. This is the equivalent in the data space. 90% of it we can't get our arms around. Think about the solutions that are in that data if we can get to it. 
because we're in a sense just seeing a little slice of the world when beyond that little slice there's great opportunity and probably great danger for humanity if we can't get our arms around the rest of that space. So in my mind, this is not a journey to reproduce what the human mind does. Yes, we'll be inspired by what the human mind can do, but that is not the objective. The objective is to analyze and garner insights from that massive amounts of data. If we don't, that 93% will just keep growing and we'll be getting such a minute view of what's going on in the world uh, that we'll really be in a, in a very, very rough place. So think about the industries that could be affected by this. And I don't make these things up. We are working with every one of these industries that I'm gonna show you. Oil and gas, huge opportunity. They, the industry spends billions of dollars per oil rig Often, uh, drilling is in the wrong place, they miss it. Often the pumping from the wells of the reservoirs is too much, too little, not optimized. A huge opportunity. Tens of thousands of sensors on these platforms. More than current analytic capability can deal with. Huge opportunity to impact the oil and gas industry. Retail, we talked a little bit uh, before about the massive amounts of data that's coming through social media. Think of the content and the insights that can be garnered from that for retailers. As many of you know, we have a partnership with Twitter where we get the, the big hose, if you will, from Twitter of all tweets. Incredible insights into buying patterns, preferences, where society is moving insights that can be leveraged across literally every form of commerce. The Internet of Things, again, I think is one of the great next frontiers. Signal processing. We started with Watson in natural language processing, which led, of course, to the infamous Jeopardy match, and today it's, it's unmatched in natural language capability. We've moved it to images and vision, but think about signal processing. Machine to machine, data will dominate the data scene in just a few years. And that is noisy, unstructured, and really a perfect application for cognitive computing, whether it's connected appliances or an inner city where you're dealing with security issues, where you're dealing with traffic management issues, all of the things that are, are going on in the city. A perfect environment for a cognitive system. Security, another area that you might not think of as a natural, but security is no longer about building firewalls. Security now is about deep behavioral analysis of people and systems, a perfect application of cognitive systems to measure and predict behaviors and abnormalities and react to them in real time. Energy and utilities. We already have instrumented many of uh, the meters in many, many countries, but the data now, again, remains dark. Very little is being done. It's a huge opportunity as we try to integrate renewables in and start to feed back and alter behaviors um, of consumers. And one of the biggest, of course, is healthcare. Uh, as I mentioned before, an enormous industry ripe for not only digital disruption, which was sort of what happened with electronic medical records, but cognitive disruption as we really bring in new forms of insight. And this is one of the industries where we have really double down uh, our bets, not only uh, through electronic medical records, patient population, health care, but also medical images, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But think about it, a million gigabytes per person in our lives, immense amount of information, and in that data is really the secret to our own health and well-being. Transportation, another internet of things. We started with you know, processors in cars. We're now talking about self-driving or assisted cars. These devices will need to be cognitive. They will need to make real-time, on-the-fly decisions about the environment based on learning about the environment and the driver behavior. So every single industry now is being swamped in data. Every industry is trying to find a way to get at and access to that 80 to 90% of the dark data and get insights to differentiate. 
And I think that is really what's going on here in terms of the turning point in, in, uh, in our industry and in all of these industries. So think about this in terms of we are at an incredible inflection point. We are no longer just sort of incrementally improving our IT equipment. The first era of computing was simply a set of tabulating machines, largely mechanical. We put data in through punch cards or some other means of setting switches. We programmed it by telling the machine what to do. And away we went and we automated basic human tasks such as uh, arithmetic. The second era of computing, which began in the late 40s and early 50s, was a real turning point where we went to programmable systems. And the point in time where this really started was when we had enough memory in the computer that we could put the programming from the punch cards into the computer and let the system run itself with no external uh, programming. And it, again, it was because we had enough memory in the system to put those instruction sets into the memory. And of course, away we went. And everything since the late 40s to today has been programmable. But again, as we looked at this uh, a, a number of years ago in IBM Research, we said, you know what? We're going to run out of programmers. There are no way we are going to be able to program and keep up with the scale and speed and exponential growth of data, we had better take a different path. And that was what really got us on this cognitive computing AI path in a major, major way. And we believe that we are at one of these very unique points in time that only occurs every 40 or 50 years in this industry where we are creating entirely new computer systems that do entirely different things than the last era. This era will be more different from the programming than programming was from the tabulating era, in my belief. Think about also what happened with that you know, infamous System 360, which was IBM had done uh, small numbers of programmable systems before that 360, but the 360 was a platform. It was a platform where we mass produced the systems we separated the hardware and software, and we created a platform that became the platform that transformed banking, airlines, transportation, uh, literally every industry in the world, and remains sort of the backbone of all enterprise transactions. It's important in this new era to also think about a platform, not a discrete tool to address one problem, but a platform that will transform a number of industries and that is how we are thinking about this in IBM and what we're trying to achieve with our cognitive system and, and with Watson. So it all began, it, it doesn't seem possible, <clears throat> but it was almost five years ago, five years ago in February, that this infamous match occurred between Watson, the first uh, really uh, cognitive platform, and, uh, and human beings. Our goal that day was not to just you know, win a game show. In fact, um, it, was, it was a pretty close match for those of you that study that, that game. Uh, but we wanted to demonstrate that we were going through a transition. We were going through a transition from this programmable era into this cognitive era. And you know, I've been amazed, frankly, what happened since February 2011. This whole field has exploded. Um, it has stirred the imagination of academia, it's stirred the imagination of industry, uh, which I think is fantastic. Um, because again, this is not about one company or one capability. This is about creating a whole new, a whole new era of computing. Uh, lots of stories I could tell about that match. I'll, I'll just tell you one, one fun one. Uh, I talked to, to Ken and Brad about how do you do what you do? I mean, these, these Two human beings are amazing, amazing. I mean, they, I asked them, well, how do you, how do you know so much? Did you, did you study? And both of them independently said to me, no, everything I see and hear, I never forget. I remember it. And I said, OK, that's pretty interesting. And then I said, well, when you're asked a question, what reasoning process do you go through? Because I know how my brain works. You know, I'll start to think about alternatives. I'll do lookups in my head. Uh, both of them independently said, I don't know, 
the answer is just instantly in my head. So they have complete memory and instant recall of everything they've ever seen. Incredible capability. To beat these two humans, that system had to be right 85 to 90 percent of the time in two and a half seconds, or it was lights out. That is a really tough problem in open domain. The reason we won is that we took an entirely different approach. Not a rules-based approach, but an open approach, machine learning, deep learning, and uh, very sophisticated natural language processing. A completely different approach uh, to the problem. And that, I think that's what's required across the board. So where do we need to go with this then as humans? Because we're often, one of the positives of that match was it really set the stage for cognitive computing. It captured people's imagination. But it also set up man versus machine. And that was not the intent at all. Where do we go? It's not man versus machine. Every study has shown that man and machine will beat either man or machine. And that, I think, is a really key point because of the different capabilities uh, that we each have. So we as humans have a number of capabilities which I'm not sure we'll ever be able to really get a machine to do. Now, I, I hesitate to say that because I said that before and we've gone on to get machines to do that. But some of these things relative to intuition, uh, compassion, moral values, you know, unless they can really be quantified, I don't ever see a system being able to, to do that. On the other hand, these massive systems have immense capability. They'll have total recall. They'll, they'll be the Jenner and Rudder uh, of, uh, of computing. They'll have instant recall of everything, source to all knowledge, uh, large-scale capability for fact-checking, and with deep learning um, and the capability to start to reason, we can really get into discovery. So I think the opportunity again here is man and machine. And we are seeing this in every discipline and in every industry that we go into with Watson. And the pattern seems to be that we as humans have sort of a normal distribution of capability for whatever it is we're talking about. It could be simply a call center operator or literally an oncologist, a cancer doctor. And the distribution is not surprising to technical people, a normal distribution. What we're finding in this man plus machine is that we can move that distribution. We can take the best oncologists at Memorial Sloan Kettering and make them even better. We can take the mean of the distribution and move it, and we can take those that are on the tail end of the distribution and move them up to be as good as anyone else in the world by introducing this man and machine. And we're seeing this repeatedly in the financial sector uh, in, and across uh, other industries of the world. So the secret is then, how do we get this synergy between man and machine? Now, since that Jeopardy match, uh, this field has lit up, just lit up. And that's, of course, what brings a uh, colloquium like this together. Lots of people are working on this. Lots of people are trying to do image processing and you know, finding pictures of cats on the internet and, and, and whatnot. Lots of people are trying to optimize buying behavior. Lots of people are trying to do signal processing of voice or making voice recognition smarter. But each of these is really a point solution to improve some sort of one-dimensional aspect of a business model or something that they're trying to achieve. And it's, it's wonderful, it's great, but it is like a tool, a hammer or a screwdriver from a toolkit. Very few, and really other than ourselves at IBM, I don't know of anyone that's trying to build a whole toolkit and a whole platform equivalent to what we did with the System 360 back in 1964. We're not trying to just poke at these individual problems. We're trying to build an entire platform of capability for all industries with this cognitive computing capability. So to do that, <clears throat> we took that large machine that was Watson that won that Jeopardy match, which was uh, about half as big as this stage, and uh, was so heavy it probably would have fallen through the stage. 
uh, consumed 85,000 watts of power. We took the Watson capability out of that machine, brought it to our cloud, decomposed what was at the time one system, a question and answering system, that had basically five technologies under it. It had other bits and pieces, but these, these were the big ones. We took that capability, brought it to our cloud so that it could scale, and then we proceeded to offer that as a service, but not just that, build out a suite of services on the Watson Cloud that are composable assets. So in a sense, you as a developer can go in and pick and choose and construct a mini Watson for a solution for your problem. And this has been incredibly successful. We have held, you know, on one extreme we've held hackathons where I still say kids, but you know, young people in 12 hours are composing meaningful solutions with those assets on the Watson Cloud in a day or two. Very, very powerful sort of time to market. Now this was a fundamental decision that we made in IBM right after that Jeopardy match. We could have started just selling Watson boxes and we could have sold a lot of Watson boxes. But we decided that no, we were going to make this cloud-based and as a service composable for all industries. And that has been what has guided us uh, over the past few years as we build this. And as you can see, while we have a couple of dozen or so of these services available today, this will grow. This has become the platform for our ecosystem. We have hundreds of partners now building with this capability. Dozens of universities engaged in this. Hundreds of universities engaged in educating and how to, in a sense, program or assemble with this language and to develop the underlying skills to use this. And as you can see, our plan is to develop not just dozens, but hundreds of these services on the Watson Cloud as fast as we can. We have a pipeline of these services, and I think you're going to find that this is a very rich environment. So when you step back, then you say, OK, we're building this platform. We're building all these capabilities. What is the essence of what we're trying to do? What is the essence of this cognitive uh, capability? First is learning at scale. Learning at scale in data, learning at scale in those solu solutions. It's about reasoning or developing insights from the data, whether it's natural language or images. It's reasoning over that with purpose, with purpose, with a goal, whether it's a radiologist or uh, uh, a financial advisor, someone that is reasoning over data to get an insight with a purpose to take an action. And then finally, to interact with humans. Because as I said, in the end, it's this magic of man and machine that I think is going to produce really leapfrog capabilities going forward. So what gets me excited and has kept me you know, helping to drive this project forward is to really start to think about how we can rethink what's, what's possible with this technology. It's no longer about just automating or programming these systems for ERP or back office or mobile phones and, and connections. The possibilities with this are immense. Medical imaging. Uh, we in IBM are absolutely convinced that with Watson capability, with image analytics, with machine learning over these images, we can change the course of healthcare. Vast majority, on the order of two thirds of health information is contained in images, x-rays, MRIs, uh, CAT scans, et cetera. We know that the diagnosis associated with those images by humans is not what it needs to be. Think about a radiologist who sits in a room and looks at thousands of these images a day. Obviously, fatigue sets in and, and other uh, human, natural human uh, issues set in. So we have, are in the process of buying a company, Merge Healthcare, 30 billion medical images. We are going to train Watson on those medical images. And not only are we going to do the analytics on the image, we're going to bring 
the learnings from the electronic medical records because Watson can read the medical records. Bring that information together, bring insights from previous patients and previous outcomes all in one place with the physician to make a decision on treatment in minutes. Very, very powerful capability. I think this is going to change the, the course of healthcare. It's going to change outcomes and it's going to take a lot of waste out of the system. Seismology. As I mentioned earlier, we're walking, working with a number of the world's largest oil and gas companies. They are building cognitive environments for decision making. Decision making around where do we build, drill the next well? Do I bid on this piece of land to try to get the oil reserves underneath? What's going to happen to those reserves over time? These are very complex decisions that need to be made, in many cases, in very short periods of time. I think that we're going to help transform what has also become a very intensive uh, data industry. Education is another one that I'm particularly excited about. In a sense, there's a direct analogy between education and healthcare. Today in healthcare, I'm oversimplifying, but we are still diagnosing and treating to the average, by and large. You're still going to get a uh, you know, prescription or a treatment that is to the doc's best understanding what people sort of like you on average, uh, he, he or she has seen in the past. Education is very much the same. We put our children in a class and by and large the teachers teach to the average and they try to adjust a little bit for children on the two extremes. Think about having a Watson engaged in the education system with the individual student, where Watson can observe the learning patterns and decide, you know what, uh, this child is not learning properly, or this, this child is having no problem with these concepts, but cannot learn this concept, and intervening at that moment. Think about a pre-K, or we know that between the ages of two and three, the number of words that child learns is a direct correlation to their ultimate potential. Think about Watson intervening and doubling or tripling the vocabulary of a two or three year old and accelerating learning. Huge opportunity to change the education uh, system and the outcomes that we see. Think about genomics, another area of healthcare. Genomic data will probably eventually swamp image data. Everyone involved in genomics will tell you more data than I know what to do with. I not only cannot deal with the hundreds of mutations, I cannot deal with the thousands of pathways that may be causing that tumor uh, to manifest itself. Think about using a Watson to do matching, to understand what do those mutations mean and what is the right uh, drug or cocktail to use for that cancer. Working with a number of leading edge genomic institutions around the United States and Canada to explore what Watson can do in this area. Frankly, it's the only way we're <coughs> going to deal with genomic data. So let me end then by reflecting on uh, some words that I found from uh, Thomas Watson Jr. As you all probably know, Thomas Watson was our founder and Tom Watson Jr. Uh, ran the company during the time of the 360 and a lot of our explosive growth. And I thought that this this quote was, was quite interesting because he describes systems that you know, are not going to quote unquote rob man of his initiative, but are going to start to take away some of the, what he refers to as menial tasks, mental menial tasks, um, and free us up for creativity and, and other things. And in a sense, that's what happened during the programmable era. We, we took what we wanted the machine to do, we put it in the memory, we made the machine do what we wanted, and we went off and did more creative processes. I don't know what Mr. Watson would think about what we could do with Watson itself, but think about the fact that it's no longer about displacing work. Machines displace manual labor, programmable systems displace the menial, quote unquote, mental processes. We're now talking about man and machine tackling problems that were inconceivable just a few years ago, whether it's education, healthcare, energy sources, 
on and on and on. Some of the world's biggest problems, I believe, are going to be solved by these technologies. So again, I'll sort of end where I started. I urge you, throughout the course of the day, enjoy, participate in the discussion around the technology, around what's going on in artificial intelligence, but don't fall into the trap of we're trying to reproduce a human brain, and don't fall into just the deep technology trap. Think about the applications of this technology, whether you're going to create a business, whether you want to apply this into your field or your discipline, there is not an industry or discipline that won't be completely transformed by this technology over the next decade. 